Okay. I have one tale of two cities joke. I used to tell all my ninth graders at start. T.S. Eliot was contemplating a sequel to uh, his poem about cats. Mm -hmm. A tale of two kitties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, Warner Brothers took that up, didn't they? <laughs> they probably did. Yeah. Certainly <laughs> Disney. We can go to the first slide. Okay. I had a wonderful some wonderful cartoons about a tale of two cities, but I couldn't get them to transfer to my PowerPoint. So after much effort, I gave up. So we're beginning with this rather grim information. But the point is that Sidney Carton is not the only martyr, he's a fictional one. You'll recognize the portrait of Marat, freshly murdered. He had been one of the leaders from early in the revolution and sometimes blamed with instigating some of the more violent events. And on the right, of course, is Charlotte Corday wearing her Normandy bonnet, which became very popular uh, for some reason after she was guillotined. But I don't know if you know the story of Charlotte Corday. She was a uh, Girondin, a follower of the more moderate party. And she got into Marat's apartment by saying that she had a list of enemies to give him who could be denounced and guillotined. And in the painting by Marat's friend David, he may be holding Charlotte's fake list of enemies, but she got in and stabbed him to death. And a few days later was guillotined, of course. And then we have, of course, Sidney Carton, whom, uh, whom I wanna talk more about later, of course, but this is a very romantic image of him ascending the steps here. <laughs> Well, I wanted to, uh, we can go to the next slide. I couldn't resist, but put up uh, argumentum ad ignorantium, which as you probably know, is the demand that your opponent prove a negative or prove that something didn't happen. <laughs> And um, I won't go into present day politics, but it seems to me we're sort of lost in this fallacy right now, trying to prove something didn't happen. <laughs> but in arguing, particularly as I recall, for the execution of Danton, his former associate, Robespierre actually made the statement, I can't quote him directly, but we can't prove, neither can Danton, that he was not plotting. By its very nature, a plot is secret. So <laughs> we have no proof, but he should still go to the guillotine. <laughs> and I just put in the famous question from Cervantes, does anyone recognize that? The windmills. Yes, the windmills. Yeah. And this is uh, Sancho Panza saying what giants were. <laughs> In other words, he's avoiding the uh, ad ignorantium fallacy. <laughs> And I won't go through all of these right away, but uh, uh, the escaped, just went up, the attempted escape of the royal family to Austria got 
stopped, I think the same day they set out, maybe the next morning, and got as far as Varennes, where they are apprehended and brought back to Paris and subsequently imprisoned. And I think historians agree this kind of destroyed respect for the royal family. Uh, again, this is an episode that Dickens does not include in his novel, as I recall, even briefly by reference. Now, I wanted to go back just a little to the end of last week's reading because it has to do with the sort of compression of history that we find in A Tale of Two Cities. So you might remember oh, shortly after the tennis court oath in 1789, there was what we call the great fear from July 20th to August 6th. And this was a time when tenants and maybe tenant farmers invaded the chateau and manor houses, burning some. In some cases, apparently, they were really looking for the documents that gave the, the noble or the overlord special privileges and that the peasants or the third estate did not have. And sometimes in the confusion of burning all these papers, the whole place caught on fire. But I wanted to take note of this passage. It's in book two, chapter 23, the fire rises. But I get a volunteer. Volunteer in my penguin. It's on page two forty. I want to take some time for it because it's probably the best set piece of description I know of anywhere. And treating it in class, I would always ask students, "What does Dickens do here?" With the description that could not be done in a movie. Of course, we know that Eisenstein credited Charles Dickens with much of the technique that was taken over by films and movies in the early 20th century. Okay. Do you need, do you need a volunteer, Wayne? Yes, I do, to read. The night deepened. Yes. The trees environing the old chateau, keeping its solitary state apart, moved with a rising wind, as though they threatened the pile of building massive and dark in the gloom. Up the two terrace flights of steps, the rain ran wildly and beat at the great door, like a swift messenger rousing those within. Uneasy rushes of wind went through the hall among the old spears and knives and passed lamenting up the stairs and, and shook the curtains of the bed where the last marquee had slept. East, west, north, and south through the woods, four heavy treading unkempt figures crushed the high grass and cracked the branches striding on cautiously to come together in the courtyard. Four lights broke out there and moved away in different directions and all was black again. Want me to keep reading? Please, please. But not for long. Presently, the chateau began to make itself strangely visible by some light of its own, as though it were growing luminous. Then a flickering streak played behind the architecture of the front, picking out transparent places and showing where balustrades, arches, and windows were. Then it soared higher and 
grew broader and brighter. Soon from the score of the great windows, flames burst forth and the stone faces awakened and stared out of fire. A faint murmur arose about the house from the few people who were left there, from the few people who were left there. And there was saddling of, of a horse and riding away. There was spurring and splashing through the darkness and bridle was drawn in the space by the village fountain. And the horse in a foam stood at Monsieur Gabel's door. Help, Gabel! Help everyone! The tocsin rang impatiently, but other help, if there were any, there was none. The mender of the roads and 250 particular friends stood with folded arms at the fountain, looking at the pillar of fire in the sky. It must be 40 feet high, said they grimly, and never moved. The rider from the chateau and the horse in, in a foam clattered away through the village and galloped up the stony steep to the prison on the crag. At the gate, a group of officers were looking at the fire, removed from them a group of soldiers. Help, gentlemen officers, the chateau is on fire. Valuable objects may be saved from the flames by timely aid. Help, help. The officers looked toward the soldiers who looked at the fire, gave no orders, and answered with shrugs and biting of lips. It must burn. As the rider rattled down the hill again and through the street, the village was illuminating. The mender of roads and the 250 particular friends, inspired as one man and a woman and woman by the idea of lighting up had darted into their houses and were putting candles in every dull little pane of glass. The general scarcity of everything occasioned candles to be borrowed in a rather peremptory manner of Monsieur Gabel. And in a moment of reluctance and hesitation on that functionary's part, the mender of roads, once so submissive to authority, had remarked that carriages were good to make bonfires with, and that post horses would roast. The chateau was left to itself to flame and burn. In the roaring and raging of the conflagration, a red hot wind driving straight from the infernal regions seemed to be blowing the edifice away. With the rising and falling of the blaze, the stone faces showed as if they were in torment. When great masses of stone and timber fell, the face of the two dints in the nose became obscured. Anon struggled out of smoke again, as if it were the face of the cruel marquis burning at the stake and contending with the fire. I guess that's that's good. It goes on for another paragraph. But I wanted to ask you if you'd notice some things here that could not affects that could not be achieved in uh, cinema. References, allusions, especially. That's a question for the room, right? Yes. Not, not just for me. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to mute. <clears throat> Are you referring to the effect on the stone faces? First of all, sure, yes. Mm. And I can't see your name. It's Karen. Irene. Uh, Irene. Irene. Lennon. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's a little too small for me. <laughs> yeah. This, yes, the stone faces were first mentioned back in book one when the Marquis is murdered, mm -hmm. and he is his face is turned to stone. And now we see his stone face again in the conflagration. Wanted to ask about that reference to a pillar of fire. Is that quoting from the Exodus story in the Bible? It could be, I think. Dickens certainly knew his Bible, mm -hmm. but in a highly ironic way. Mm. 
perhaps. That's in the paragraph that begins, a faint murmur arose from the house. And then at the end of the paragraph, pillar of fire in the sky must be 40 feet high. Certainly ironic because the original was supposed to be the sign that God was with his people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, the effect here, I think, is to make us do a double take. I suppose to some, it was a beautiful thing to see. I read recently that historians estimate only maybe a hundred chateaux and country houses were destroyed during the Great Fear. So a lot of them survived and remained. <laughs> I wanted to point out the last paragraph that we read. The chateau was left to itself to flame and burn in the roaring and raging of the conflagration, a red hot wind driving straight from the infernal regions seemed to be blowing the edifice away. The rising and falling of the blaze, the stone faces showed as they were in torment. I think that's an extraordinary allusion for a couple of reasons. Does anyone know anything about arson? I think Dickens is very accurate here. That uh, it's difficult to investigate uh, because fires don't destroy always the means by which they were started. They sometimes do. But this point about the uh, chateau exploding seemed to be blowing the edifice away. Does anyone know about its problem with, uh, especially with house fires? Apparently, a point can be reached when the place does explode. I don't know if Dickens knew that, but he knew a lot. So it's, it's, I think it is actually accurate here. And uh, what else is going on here that you could not do in film? Looking especially at a red hot wind driving straight from the infernal regions. <laughs> yes, Peggy. I think you're muted. 800 houses were destroyed. The winds blew in all directions, which is why it was so terrible. Yes. Yes. And a lot of things exploded. They had things that we have things now they didn't have then, like mm -hmm. propane uh, stuff. And a lot of things are quite willing to explode. Yes. The only yeah. things that were left from my house was the chimney, which was over a year old, a uh, hundred years old, and the dishwasher. And all the things in the Bosch stainless steel dishwasher survived, but everything else was gone. My goodness. Amazing. Yeah. I'll remember when I replaced my dishwasher. You said it's a Bosch? <laughs> yeah, well, except that Bosch is now got Bosch US, so they're all the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, it was really scary. And three days ago here, the whole weather and atmosphere and everything felt just like before the fire. And there was a lot of lightning in other places. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'll go live on a boat. I think Dickens is hinting here that the fire now is coming straight from hell. 
<laughs> in infernal regions. But uh, I think that's a comment on the chateau. That <laughs> in some ways, it's set on the, the mouth of hell. <laughs> Oh, this has been brought up a number of times, but I think I, I spoke last week about the great pendulum swing in the Tale of Two Cities, especially when the child is run over. And then we begin to have, we have sympathy for the revolutionaries. But I think this is kind of right at the midpoint of the swing with this destruction. Next slide, Wayne. This is good. I'll just run through these very briefly. We'll go back to some of these terms. But <clears throat> uh, the September, September massacres in early September 1792 were probably a prelude to the terror. And Dickens does actually refer to these, OK? Although again, in his typically digested, condensed way. So this is on, this is now in our book three, the grindstone in Telson's bank. And this is on page 272 in my penguin, the grindstone. The grindstone had a double handle and turning it madly were two men. Can you find that? <laughs> what chapter? It's chapter, so, sorry, it's chapter one of part three. I think this is shortly after Lucy and Miss Pross and Dr. Manette have arrived in Paris, more or less chasing Charles. Any volunteers? Otherwise, I'll read it. I'll read if you like. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. It starts, the grindstone had a double handle. The grindstone had a double handle. And turning at it madly were two men, whose faces as the long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were stuck upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty and all awry with howling and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. As these ruffians turned and turned, their matted locks now flung forward over their eyes, now flung backward over their necks, some women held wine to their mouths that they might drink. And what with dropping blood, and what with dropping wine, and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. The eye could not detect one creature in the group free from the smear of blood. Shouldering one another to get nixed at the sharpening stone were men stripped to the waist with a stain all over their limbs and bodies. Men in all sorts of rags with a stain upon the, those rags. Men devilishly set off with spoils of women's lace and silk and ribbon with the stain dyeing those trifles through and through. Hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords, all brought to be sharpened, were all red with it. Some of the hacked swords were tied to the wrists of those who carried them with strips of linen and fragments of dress, ligatures various in kind, but all deep of the one color. And as the frantic wielders of these weapons snatched them from the stream of sparks and tore away into the streets, the same red hue was red in their frenzied eyes, 
eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given 20 years of life to petrify with a well-directed gun. All this was seen in a moment as the vision of a drowning man or of any human creature at any very great pass could see a world if it were there. They drew back from the window and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face. Perfect, thank you. Very well done. So then a few pages later, I think Manette, excuse me, oh, sorry. Uh, Lori warns Manette that the, they're executing the prisoners. And it may be the next slide, Courtney, or one beyond that, I'm not sure. Yes, this is it, thank you. I gave you some of the stats, I think, on the right. <clears throat> During the September massacres, it's estimated half the prison population in Paris was killed, murdered. I've read somewhere that most of the prisoners were either wayward teenage boys, petty thieves, and I think some priests, but I'd have to look that up to verify it. Let's see. It started apparently with rumors that Prussian troops were going to invade Paris and set the, open the prisons and Marat was blamed, but it's not, there's not total agreement. But it's time for one more, one gory story here. Above, of course, I have the Princess de Lamval, de Lamval, who had been a close friend and confidant of Marie Antoinette. And there's an intriguing story that she was called out by the mob. She and two other noble women went down to, to the mob. Uh, for some reason, Marie Antoinette did not go. And the two other women were saved by a kind of heroic anti revolutionary. But on the left, we have a depiction. Does anyone know what this is? <laughs> in, it's in the temple, the prison that was called the temple. And that's Marie Antoinette in kind of in the center, having fainted. Well, the, the mob, this is why Paris mob came to be feared, uh, beheaded the Princess de Lamballe. And of course, legend has grown up that they disemboweled her as well, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but it does appear that the mob beheaded her. And it seems to have been actually the case that someone or some persons who knew how to do it uh, took the head and touched up the makeup and fixed the hair and put the head on a spike and waved it in front of Marie Antoinette's uh, prison window. And of course the attendants and guards there told Marie Antoinette that her her friend wanted to see her. And uh, Marie Antoinette, not really being stupid, had a sense of what was going to happen and fainted before she could see the head outside her window. If you haven't dealt with ninth graders, I remember one particular irritating comment about this scene. Well, why didn't she just refuse to go? <laughs> I thought, boy, you have lived your life taking taxis, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay, I guess we can go back a slide, Courtney. Thanks. 
Okay, I have next the Law of Suspects, which was passed in 1793. And I guess now we need to go down uh, two slides, Courtney. One more, I think this should be it. I'm sorry, these are a little bit shuffled, but the uh, book three, as you know, begins with Darnie's trip from London to Paris in 1792. And although it's before the actual law of suspects, it is possible maybe Dickens got his years reversed. But I, I quote from the fifth clause, of the actual law, of course, was in French. So suspects include those former nobles, together with husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons or daughters, brothers or sisters, and agents of the emigres, who have not constantly demonstrated their devotion to the revolution and established the Revolutionary Tribunal. But as you can say here, you had to constantly demonstrate <laughs> your devotion to the revolution. And Charles, of course, is highly sus suspect because he is an aristocrat. He is a marquis. And the, the great fear of the revolutionaries was that nobility would re return to France revolutionary France and overthrow the revolution. Uh, okay, let's see, I guess we can go back. <laughs> Sorry, Courtney. Yeah, it's good. Well, uh, Upon Charles's return, we could say that the novel goes into its closing chapters. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, one, one more back, Courtney. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> one more. Yes, that's it. Thank you. I suppose we'll, we'll see in this section that uh, Dickens is extremely oh, crafty, to put it lightly. But most of you probably know about Aristotle's beginning, middle, and end, which really doesn't hold because Aristotle says the beginning of the plot is, is an event before which nothing happens. Well, that's simply not true. <laughs> A middle event, the middle of the plot is the consequence of the beginning and the cause of the third section or the end. And then the, the third section or the end is something for which there is a cause, but no consequences. And just think about fictions we know, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> and of course, Aristotle, you know, I always feel emphasizes the turning point or uh, peripety and uh, screenwriters talk about plot points. A good script has, has at least two turning points, not one. But I want to go on to the trauma plot, and I will talk about more about this. Because a Tale of Two Cities, I think, is a, a prime example of the trauma plot. It's 
a quite frequent device, even in modern fiction, where something in the character's past accounts for the current conduct, whether they know it or not, they may discover it in the course of the fiction. Now, I wanted to ask you about your favorite endings. And I, I will tell you my favorite spectacular ending is the ending of Moby Dick. What happened to me? Sorry, Wayne, I stopped the slide share. Let me know if you want it back. Yes. Well, maybe I should turn off my camera. You can turn on your camera. It looks like it's turned off right now. Turn on my camera. Are you talking about the camera on my iPad or is there a camera icon here? There's a camera icon in the sidebar. Well, I don't think I have a sidebar. Or in the list of participants. Okay. Or you can click on the start video from your, your um, menu on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I don't seem to, oh, there it is. Start video, gotcha. It's not clicking. Hmm. Why don't I put the slide back in, in your place? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll tell you the most spectacular ending is the ending of Moby Dick. And I won't spoil it for you if you haven't read Moby Dick. 1850, so Dickens could well have read Moby Dick. I think the saddest ending has to be the ending of King Lear. I had to read it several times in order to freshen it up for teaching and it got to the point where I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> so very sad. And I was at a loss thinking of happy endings. They're harder to bring off, I think. I think the funniest ending is the ending of Young Frankenstein, Mel Brooks movie, which is not exactly literary but it, it's a very funny ending. As for a little more serious literature, the ending of Twelfth Night, I think is comical for strange reason, because if you remember, uh, Malvolio shouts on the happy couples who are getting married, because otherwise it's a marriage plot, but Malvolio shouts back, does anyone remember? <laughs> I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. <laughs> and it's comical to me because it's like a sour note in all this sort of conventional happy fulfillment. <laughs> it's like riding off into the sunset and your horse stumbles. Anyone like to share your favorite endings with us? Uh, Wayne, I don't know if you're picking this up. Karen, it's Karen here. I've got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, be, I, I know we're on endings, but before we go further with that, I wondered if we could just take a step back to your notion of the trauma plot. Oh, if you like, sure. I want uh, to. If you don't, if you don't mind. Um, okay. I would sure. like to. Uh, just change course a tad no. because what interests me so much in this novel 
is the whole area of trauma and the mind. And that resurfaces again uh, in book three, where Dr. Manet um, goes back into his um, trauma, his mm -hmm. madness after visiting yes. the prison and not being able to uh, seek the release of Darnie. And that just mm -hmm. took me back to a comment that I had wanted to make in the last month's session about trauma and the mind. If we went back to book two, chapter 19, the title of the chapter is an opinion. Uh, in my Penguin edition. It's on page 207. And it talks about relapses from past trauma. Um, yes. He goes into his first relapse after Lucy's wedding. And I just find these four pages, 207 to 211, some of the most incredible prescience on the part of Dickens in terms of trauma mm -hmm. and the mind. Um, we know since then, I mean, we know from the study of trauma that associations of smell and sight and sound can re reawaken trauma. And one of the quotes from these pages from Dickens, one train of associations would renew it right on. We also know from research how looking, looking at coping, and we have this quote about a counterweight to the stress is needed mm -hmm. when a stressor is introduced. And on page 211, we have a whole rationale for occupational therapy in psychiatric settings, working with the hands. I think this is perhaps the most incredible. He says, substituting the perplexity of the fingers for the perplexity of the brain, the ingenuity of the hands for the ingenuity of the mental torture. And I find that it is quite incredible and brilliant that there can be such a deep representation of trauma, deep understanding of it and how the mind works. This was in 1859 before any yeah. of this was really yeah. known. If I were not retired and still teaching and practicing in traumatology, I would use these four pages in terms Great. of the mind and trauma for teaching. I mean, the yeah. whole notion, it doesn't matter that Mr. Lorry and Ms. Pross went on to dismantle and remove Dr. Manet's shoemaker's bench because he doesn't need that to go back into the trauma. We have cellular memory in trauma, it's in there. And um, for me, it, I just found these four pages rather jaw dropping in terms of how, how advanced Dickens' knowledge was of what it means um, for the mind and trauma that we know so much about today, but we certainly didn't in 1859. So and, and that's the, a little, oh, on that's that note, uh, that's interesting. Uh, can, can, can you hear me too? Yep. Well, um, it's just, um, I think that um, Dickens' uh, knowledge of astronomy and optics was really advanced and I, I'm wondering if maybe he went to those lunar meetings in Birmingham and uh, got uh, and and agreed to secrecy on some things that he really mm. wanted to blurt out in some way. And two cities was his outlet. <laughs> Great. Uh, I at least one critic has pointed out that when he was in prison virtually in solitary confinement. The shoemaking really may have kept Manette from losing his mind. And I want to look later at that later passage, the substance of the shou uh, shadow. Uh, 10 years into his imprisonment, Manette feared that he was losing his mind. Mm -hmm. But it appears here uh, after the discovery that Darnie is the nephew of one and the son of the, mm. another of Manette's enemies. But it's a little complicated to me that, yeah, you said Manette doesn't need the shoemaking. So I suppose we're supposed to see it as a kind of reversion to his prison mentality 
Yeah, it, it takes you back just like, um, you know, we did the early studies of it with Vietnam veterans where you walk perhaps past something that's burning or a barbecue and it reminds you of burning yes. flesh. I mean, you don't need to be in the moment. It, Got you. you. We have cellular, yeah. So that's exactly right, Wayne. Okay, so the shoemaking has become regressive for Manette. It, instead of helping him cope, it's taking him back. Yes. Okay, yeah. yes. I'm, Very good. Well, I am a fan of uh, BBC Mysteries. And in this, I guess, post-postmodern world, in that genre, it, you almost expect every detective to have a trauma story. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just it's just an accepted thing. And sometimes, you know, it is the thing that comes forward <coughs> and helps them to solve something, you know. <coughs> I actually read a New Yorker New Yorker article a few months ago that we've had too many, too many trauma plots. <laughs> it's been overworked, but this isn't certainly an early one. I just want to briefly mention Kermode's idea that the ending really imposes form on events, imposes a meaning, meaning, meaning if you like, but I'm not sure that's the case in the Tale of Two Cities at uh, Carton's death really determines our understanding of the plot. It doesn't seem to me the case. It's a very effective, very moving ending. It's a oh, I think it's absolutely crucial. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, if uh, I, I, I wouldn't know where to start. Should I start? Are you going to, I mean, are you going to tell us, on the other hand, how it is crucial? <laughs> oh, uh, cartons? Yeah. I actually don't think it is, but I'd like to hear what other people think. Oh, well, it's just by, um, by sartorially pier piercing the firmament with number 22, the seamstress, he can then return as the barrier boy who kissed little Lucy, and he can then return. Well, actually, I think he returns in a kind of a butterfly stitch or a retrograde stitch um, before his actual death to kiss little Lucy or be kissed by little Lucy. And then to return as little Sid. Yes. Um, yeah. And and also to be the propitiation for France and the and the Evermonds and everybody else. Well, don't you think that depends on what we think the main plot is? It um, you know, if he is if the novel is about human nature and what happens in uh, uh, mob mentality or whatever he, the horrors of the reign of terror uh, you know that's one plot and, and and then we have the family plot and we have the the carton and every mound plot i mean there's he, he's not the resolution to all those things But if you can also see the, the plot of the novel as really a contest between Darnie and Carton, who's the better man? And I often would suggest to boys that, that Darnie could be the protagonist. If we had to be somebody in the novel, it probably would be Darnie. Well, it's that age-old age thing. What's the matter yeah. with Galahad and King yeah. Arthur? Galahad, too good. he's too good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to sympathize with someone like that. But uh, most of them would end up arguing that 
Carton is the hero, mm -hmm. even though for much of the novel, he's anything but heroic. I think that's, if I can interrupt, I think that's the, I think that's the genius of Dickens. You've got all of these, we've got the trauma plot, the marriage plot, Aristotle's, you know, theory, whatever. Mm -hmm. Dickens was not wedded to any kind of literary theory. Uh, True. Just as he was not wedded to any kind of socio-political philosophy, uh, he was wedded to what he observed in life. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to, um, so, you know, I think, uh, there are many plots in, or yeah. uh, many points of, I mean, the murder of <laughs> one of the high points, you know, is um, Miss Pross <laughs> mm -hmm. slaying Madame Defarge. I, it, yes. That in itself is just a, you know, uh, a special little story of uh, right <laughs> winning over evil. Yes. Uh, so I, uh, I don't think that Dickens thought of these things when he wrote. You know, I don't think he thought of, uh, uh, certainly we have evidence that he, you know, planned what was going to happen, but it was usually what was going to happen to individual characters. It was usually a matter of the life of his book rather than at any kind of imposed structure. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't disagree more. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, uh, actually, I think my, my high school English teacher pointed this out um, a long, long time ago, um, but I'm not sure. But I, I mean, it could be my imagination. But somehow, the, when the guillotine comes down, it's the same time that uh, uh, Miss Pross's eardrum is breached. Yeah. Uh, the barrier at the uh, the Paris barrier is breached and admits the party. Um, you know, it's like slam, slam, slam. Everything happens at the same time, but the turning of the key is is Carton, headless Carton, being the Deus Ex Machina uh, that enables all this. Boom! Immediately. Yeah, I, I don't I don't disagree with that at all. I just don't believe that the I don't believe that's a theoretical that that kind of you know that very neat structural coincidence is a matter of a theory a theory of plot design. Oh, I agree with that. I think Dickens used what he had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he also imitated, I think, some of the models. We know that he loved Henry Fielding's novels. And Tom Jones has not exactly a trauma plot, but a concealed origins plot, mm -hmm. which I won't give away in, in case you, it's delightful to find out when we finally find out who Tom is, for example. But. <laughs> But uh, someone whose name I won't mention uh, on the faculty of the Dickens universe, someone uh, told me that Dickens suffered from the anxiety of the influence. And then, Trudy, this goes up to what you're saying. <laughs> and I thought, well, that, that's really a ridiculous contention. <laughs> You know, like Dickens was worried about imitating his his models too much. I don't think so. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Can I say my favorite ending at this time since you brought up? Perfect, sure. Fielding. Yes. Um, I, uh, I well, I've got two. Uh, one of them is uh, Huck Finn. Uh, oh yes. Lighting out for the territory because. Mm -hmm. He's seen civilization, which we're seeing right now in pretty bad shape. 
Yes. <laughs> and uh, the other one is is 18th century, is Gulliver's Travels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gulliver prancing around like a horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And goes out to the stable to talk to the horse. Goes out to the stable, <laughs> you know, and can hardly stand the company of his uh, family. Um, the uh, someday I'd love to do an 18th century novel. Uh, like uh, trouble is, they're kind of long. Uh, like Tom Jones, together with Dickens at the Universe, because the humor. <laughs> And those books is wonderful. Yeah. I've got an ending for you. Great. <laughs> I just read a very good biography of Tom Stoppard. And one of the dramatic endings that he loved is in a play called The Front Page. The yes. romantic male lead and is going off on his honeymoon. And he gets out the door, the, the, the editor who really doesn't want him to go, makes a touching speech and gives the reporter, the editor's gold watch. Yeah. <laughs> the hero and the girl go out the door. <laughs> the editor picks up the phone and calls the police and says, can you stop? So whatever the guy's name is, mm -hmm. son of a bitch stole my watch. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I've got a couple of things that I would like to say about the ending of this. In rereading it, it became clearer and clearer to me that one of the recurrent themes is resurrection, mm -hmm. recalled from the dead. Yeah. Jerry Cruncher is what was known as a resurrection man. Yeah. <laughs> and toward the end, Sidney Carton is quoting the Bible about giving up your life for a friend. Yeah. I think I think part of what he's doing is driving the nail home on resurrection. And for, uh, what Carton is doing is reshaping his own life so that it has a meaning. His previous idea of his own life has been very much, uh, he had a lot of potential and he wasted it all. So here at least he's able to do something. And this is this is revises his his story because of the way he chose to end it. Very, very, very good. Uh, yeah. I'd like to respond to that, um, to David's point about this last chapter as an ending. I find it one of the most moving um, in Dickens, quite frankly. And back to your point, Wayne, as far as who is the hero, I think we could look at Sidney Carton as perhaps a sentimental hero. That's not okay. my original thinking. Um, Valerie Purton, who wrote a book called Dickens and the Sentimental Tradition, it's a 2014 book that I would highly recommend. She designates um, Sidney Carton as a sentimental hero. And it, she goes on to talk about this particular last chapter and the ending, and she talks about sentimental tears. I don't know how many of you cry uh, when you read Dickens at various points, but a lot of people have described that emotion. And this is a beautiful quote. She says, sentimental tears not to be dismissed as unintelligent simply because they do not involve the intellect. Perhaps when we cry reading Dickens, we are losing our identity, but experiencing the ecstasy of being purely, merely, irrationally human. 
And I Great. think this, this whole book takes us into a shared human experience. It doesn't matter which group. I mean, your um, stout article that you sent out to us was so helpful. I think, Wayne, in terms of the indifference to individual distinction. I mean, we're, we're caught up really with the ability to identify with both of these tremendously yes. polarized groups. And uh, that's the strength of it. I mean, the every one singular becoming the many, um, the whole shared experience of that is so tremendous in this novel to me. If you haven't seen the 1935 movie, the uh, ending is handled very well. In addition, Ronald Coleman is a fantastic actor. And uh, it's like some other older movies. One of the stars stands out as fabulous and the others are overacting badly. <laughs> you know? But I always showed the clip, not only of Madame Defarge and Miss Pross fighting, but also of Sidney Carton, who was nearly recognized and exposed by the seamstress. And I couldn't find a, the clip of that on YouTube anywhere. It's those, both those scenes are, of course, near the end of the novel and near the end of the movie. But the dialogue with the seamstress, as played by Rodel Coleman, is fantastic really fantastic. And that chimes in with the idea that he's giving his life meaning and she, even though she won't live long, recognizes. And since it's a novel that we recognize it through, through her. And it's hard for me to read that scene without crying. <laughs> yes, very difficult. Any other favorite endings, happy, sad, Sensational. Mona has her hand up. Oh, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say um, one thing that was resurrected um, since uh, somebody somebody was just talking about uh, recalling to life, and there was another thread, but I'm having a senior moment, and I I forgot one of the two tie-ins here to my comment. So. Um, I, I think that uh, the, some of the things that are being recalled to life are um, things like the diamonds in Mr. Laurie's pocket. Di Mr. Laurie has had a hard road to hoe throughout life, but if he hadn't had it, he wouldn't be there to, to help save Darnay. Um, mm. And Sidney Carton has been through the ringer maybe made some bad decisions, who knows? I think he was too depressed to really be that responsible for his decisions, but, um, you know, but if he hadn't done that, he wouldn't be on hand to save Darnay. Um, and and um, Manette, you know, if he hadn't, if he hadn't made his faux pas, or if he hadn't gotten into the coach, if bad things hadn't happened to him, um, they they wouldn't even have met Charles. Uh, I think Charles even points that out. So, oh, and and Pruss, if you might think uh, she she regrets being a funny looking uh, lady, but in the end, it really helped her. It helped her to escape. It helped her to help people. Um, so all these all these things have been recalled to life that that people thought you know yes. were regretful. <laughs> yes, that's very good. Yes, I can't resist commenting on a, I think some critic, maybe an early one, commented that Carton is really a good guy because he's, even though he's probably alcoholic, he's in, in next in line for Lucy. And if he just lets Darnie go to the guillotine, <laughs> he could ride, you know, take the channel back to England with Lucy. <laughs> so at least this critic saw Carton as rejecting that possibility. <laughs> oh no, oh no, he's in line for little Lucy. She is crazy about him. Okay, you'll have to wait though. <laughs> 
yeah. <laughs> he can be stepdad. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, excellent comments on this ending. Yeah, the, the last point I'd make about Kermode, who goes on to say that in the novel, there's a balance between form that is plotting and verisimilitude. And of course, people criticize Tom Jones and to some extent Dickens of being over plotted. But so much fun is in the plot. And uh, one reason I like Taylor Storr's book is that he makes the case that all the details and the graphic descriptions in Dickens actually turn out to relate to plot in some way. But as we read, we're not always aware that all this will fit into the overall pattern or design. Now, I want to look at Manet, Manette's manuscript because for a long time, it has struck me that his manuscript, when it is read before the tribunal, is recalling to life the abuses that he suffered under the old regime. And it's not an entirely good thing because Manette has just been able to free Darney on the basis of Manette's being imprisoned in the Bastille. He's a hero, but that doesn't last long when the manuscript is read. So uh, recall to life can have a double meaning here. Some things in the past are possibly left unknown, but the manuscript, the substance of the shadow really is the, what's the word in a puzzle, the keystone in the, the plot structure. Everything clicks in the place after we read that. Uh, someone mentioned, a couple people have mentioned that the novel is not popular in France. <laughs> and I think that this might be a difficulty because uh, with the sacrifice of Carton and the dialogue with the seamstress and uh, we might feel the pendulum has swung but then Manette's manuscript is so powerful at least I find it powerful that it's like a, a double blow after the early outrage the marquee over uh, running over the boy and uh, after all, our villains here are all French. Am I wrong? Bar said it's kind of in the middle, but it's Defarge's uh, are, especially Madame Defarge, of course. Who is based, based at least on more than one actual figure. But the the last part of the book does seem to you know, give us a really dark notion. I wanted to look at the substance of the sh sh uh, substance of the shadow, partly because I think it's brilliant writing, and it may I don't know give away some of Dickens' technique. This is chapter ten of book three. And remember, this is being read as evidence before the tribunal, if I'm not mistaken. And I've already mentioned that Dickens is relying here on a long history of Bastille literature, 
very, very popular. Some of it reportedly by escaped prisoners. Maybe the best novel is by Alexandre Dumas, sometimes known as the, the man in the iron mask. So I, Alexandre Minette, unfortunate physician, native of Bouvet, and afterwards resident in Paris, <laughs> writing this manuscript. And it's of course a wonder that it's found. Do you remember who finds the manuscript? Defarge, he went looking for it. Yes, Defarge knows it's there. And there is a foresh uh, foreshadowing passage much earlier in the novel where I think people in the wine shop are talking about a discovered manus manuscript. But yes, Defarge knows or suspects it's there. Yeah. Any speculation as to another reason, he, he knows it's there. Defarge spends a lot of time chipping away the brick to find the manuscript and finally does. <laughs> It's possible that in the time that Manette, Dr. Manette's been staying with him and his mm -hmm. wife after he's freed, that he hears about it. But that, but that, yeah. you know. Yes. Yes. It's quite possible that Manette told him, although Dickens doesn't reveal that, but if he did, this would only add to Manette's sense of guilt that he is brought all this to light by his own hand. Would probably but, have been unintentional because he didn't appear before his daughter's appearance. He doesn't appear to have been in a fit state true. to make conscious decisions. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, I'm just, this is of course pure speculation, extra textual. But the one thing that puzzled me when I was reading it this time is when you see the storming of the Bastille and the fir and you see Defarge trying to find the document, he doesn't appear to find it or to there isn't a, a discussion there of yes. action that would see give him a chance to do it. And then at the end there he has it. So I'm just wondering, you know, sort of did he go back again <laughs> you know, to look for Good it? Good question, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Because it takes him some time to find it. Yes. I've always admitted, I think there are a couple of loose strings in the novel, but being Dickens, they're not, they're not seriously distracting. I think Roger Cly, Dickens wanted two witnesses against Darney, but then he doesn't really know what to do with Roger Cly. The best thing to do is have him die, have his body stolen. And then I think Striver is a problem for Dickens, again, because he wanted a double in the courtroom, two attorneys. But Striver uh, proposes to Lucy, and he's a uh, a uh, blustery, unlikable fellow, but one of the least interesting characters, I think. But yeah, you're right. How does he find that manuscript? I wanted to look at what I would call the nested narration in the substance of the shadow. And let's see, I'm um, two, four, six pages into chapter 10. And the picture of the Evremont brothers here is about as condemning as it can be. Manette comments, I saw him looking down at this handsome boy whose life was ebbing out as if he were a wounded bird 
or hare or rabbit, not at all as if he were a fellow creature. So, <laughs> but then I'm gonna go down just a few more paragraphs to the beginning of the boy's narrative. Remember, this is being quoted by Dr. Manette in, as part of his letter. And so the, the boy's narration as he's bleeding to death continues almost uninterrupted for another two pages. This is one of those unnecessary details that Storr says turns out to be necessary. <laughs> the boy has just just about ended his narrative with the killing blow made by one of the Evremonts. My glance, this is the boy, my glance had fallen. No, no, excuse me. This is Manette, I'm sorry. But the, my glance had fallen but a few moments before on the fragments of a broken sword lying among the hay. That weapon was a gentleman's. In another place lay an old sword that seemed to have been a soldier's. Now lift me up, doctor, lift me up. Where is he? <laughs> so I drove generations of students crazy by asking them on a reading quiz or a test, what, explain the significance of this short passage describing a broken sword and then an old soldier's sword. <laughs> And they handled it pretty well. Of course, uh, Ebrimon has broken his own sword, apparently out of shame for having stained it with the peasant's blood, for having actually fought a peasant boy. Does anyone want to comment on the old soldier's sword, which to me is so, such powerful Dickens? I, I'm assuming that that means that that the uh, Defarge, that uh, Madame Defarge's father was a soldier, and it was his sword that the boy was yeah. using. Yes, I think so. Yes. Yeah, the boy has used an old soldier's sword to defend his sister's honor. Mm. Yeah, and of course Dickens doesn't tell us that. That would be boring. But. <laughs> If we stop for a moment and look at that sword and think about it, <laughs> then it hits us. Yeah. <laughs> Donna had her hand up uh, just a oh, little while ago. I'm sorry, I'm not using my menu here. Uh, Donna, do you still have a question? I found a way to mic up. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think in the substance of the shadow, um, a lot of things got recalled to life, like um, yes, like like the 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 um, the letter to the authorities, and just like the um, like the uh, uh, artifact that Darnay was describing that had been burned, where they looked through the tower uh, in England and um, they found up a. They, they found something burned up that nobody could read. Um, Perfect. That's it, the foreshadowing. Yes. Yeah. So it's like um, first, first his uh, his um, witness was 
recalled to life, but then his witness, his other witness was recalled to life in, I mean, and, and, and both were in a very bad way. Like at first he couldn't witness against the Evermonts. And then, uh, later in witnessing against the Evermonts, um, uh, he was witnessing against himself, uh, in a, in a way that I think is aligned with uh, scripture. What scripture could you explain? I believe there's something in the Bible about um, uh, people being condemned by their own words. Okay. And I, I actually I thought that was why um, mm -hmm. that was why um, Minette was. Um, was so bummed out on Christmas Eve uh, and like, um, mm -hmm. you know, completely relapsing, uh, the worst relapse we ever, ever saw. Um, it's because um, I think that's when he figured that he was, uh, he was in a state of perdition by his own witness or yes. something analogous. Yeah, his own testimony. Yeah. I... I find the substance of the shadow, again, to be a fabulous piece of writing. If I were teaching writing, I would certainly want students to examine this chapter very carefully. For one thing, I think Dickens has a perfect control of tone here. The boy sounds different from Manette, and Manette sounds different from Dickens. <laughs> In, in my view, anyway, you can you can tell them apart. Uh, does anyone think of other nineteenth-century novels that have like, most of the fiction related to another character, who in turn presumably is relating it either to a narrator or directly to the reader, but. So at least one famous novel comes to mind uh, some years before A Tale of Two Cities. Wuthering Heights. Oh, perfect, yes. <laughs> perfect, yeah. Most of the story is narrated by Nellie Dean, who's kind of oh. a nosy Parker, yeah. <laughs> How about Sartre Rosario? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, a Sardar Rosartus came immediately to mind. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Is it Toothful Struck? <laughs> it's hilarious. No one mentions this, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think like Wuthering Heights is actually narrated by a tourist named Lockwood, who is quoting Nellie Dean. Now here, the credibility of the boy's testimony and Manette's letter is established by whom that we should take this as substantial evidence. By Manette? Well, yes, and by even um, more, su more surprising person who hears the letter read. Well, on the credibility of Manette, I'm just quoting one of several statements he makes about his own memory. This is like on the second page of the chapter. Oh, 
Oh yeah, he says he says he still loves sound mind. Yes, exactly right. Yes. I repeat this conversation exactly as it occurred. I have no doubt that it is word for word the same. I describe everything exactly as it took place, constraining my mind not to wander from the task. When I make the broken marks that fellow here, I have off, I have I leave off for the time and put my paper in my hiding place, right? So he's claiming, yes, just as you said, he's, this was written in the 10th year of his captivity, towards the end of the 10th year of his captivity. And at least once more, he claims that he recalls this distinctly and accurately. So does this shed light on Dickens' own narration and what he considered truth? <laughs> and what makes a narrative true, in other words? Manette is saying his memory is so clear at this point that the, the narrative is true. Okay. I thought it was interesting that Manette claims to have complete veracity here, but Dickens has to exercise a different kind of veracity in his writing. Now, I'm suggesting that when the letter is read, it gains more credibility from an unexpected source. <laughs> okay. Madam I was thinking, Orange. go ahead. Go ahead. Madame Defarge. Yeah. Yeah. From our our wicked Madame Defarge <laughs> hears it and evidently accepts this is what her brother said. So it's an it's a strange twist of events. Okay. They can go to another slide, Courtney. Okay, already shot this one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, oh, this is the last, I think. Couldn't resist Classics Illustrated. Am I the only person who, here who, as a child, used to look forward to the next issue of Classics Illustrated? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I love them. <laughs> You're not, you're not the only one. I'm sure we all did. I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember one on the French Revolution. I think that was the title, French Revolution. And sadly, I lost it. Maybe I can find one on eBay. But as I recall, it was a pretty accurate though simplified rendition of the French Revolution, which you know is high drama. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> yes. And I think the one 
on the left, maybe earlier, I'm not sure, but it's interesting what, what contrasting covers they have. So on the up top, we have a triumphant revolutionary. So maybe this one was sold in France, I don't know. But the one on the bottom, of course, is the uh, the death of Carton about to occur. <laughs> now, on the right, is an illustration, I think, maybe from the 1880s. I couldn't find one by Fizz, showing the standoff and then later uh, actual fight between Ms. Pross and Madame Defarge. So <laughs> these are two sturdy women here. <laughs> So uh, it's a very teachable scene because Dickens brings together uh, a number of metaphors, the broken vessel, but most of all the water that reaches the feet of Madame Defarge. So I think that uh, it's a good example of Dickens drawing the threads together in this magnificent scene. And someone's already mentioned that unawares, Ms. Pross sacrifices her hearing in order to prevent Madame Defarge from discovering the escape. <laughs> okay. I remember when I first showed this scene to ninth graders, and I had prepared them for it. But when this process, Madame Defarge, you shall not prevail against me. I am an English woman. <laughs> and when Miss Pross gets up from the dead body of Madame Defarge, the boys all jumped up and cheered. <laughs> So it is a climactic moment. Uh, there were, of course, other movie versions of Tale of Two Cities besides the one in 1935. There was one in 1958 I didn't know about starring Dirk Bogard. And there was one in, I think in 1980, uh, starring Chris Sarandon, playing a double role as both Carton and Darney. And then there was one made for the French, I guess bicentennial in 1989. I'm not sure, I'm sure there must have been a silent version too, but it's lent itself to, to movies in more ways than one. Okay, I'm sure I've missed somebody's questions. Any questions you want to raise here that I've skipped over or treated cursorily? Trudy and then Martha. Yeah, uh, on that first list of things we were going to cover, um, you had Don Giovanni. What was all that about? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yes. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because in the substance of the sh shadow, the boy describes the rape of his sister, mm -hmm. and. Dickens might be alluding to the droit du seigneur. Mm -hmm. 
the oh, right of the master. The right of the, the right of the master, yeah, okay. Yeah, which, and I, his, the right of the master to sleep with the bride on her wedding night. <laughs> Sure. I could not. I could not find the passage. What historians now say is, there probably never was such a thing, but there's no doubt that the master, the lord, or the nobleman, certainly took advantage of his uh, servants and uh, serfs, shall we say. I could not find the passage. I ran across it in graduate school, but it may be Chateaubriand, I'm not sure. But he, he mentioned visiting a nobleman on his manor who retained as many of the old practices as possible. And so this would be in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. But the writer said he had no doubt that the nobleman or the, the overlord had had, as he put it, carnal relations with everybody on his property. <laughs> and he went on in detail. He said that the boy who served him at dinner was his son and so forth. And <laughs> the cook was his daughter. And, <laughs> and that's what the boy is alluding to, probably not the, the droit de seigneur. But I put up the marriage of Figaro there because it, there's an interesting oh, story right. attached to it. Yeah. The marriage of Figaro was first a play, of course in French, by Beaumarchais, but it represented the droit du seigneur as, of course, one of the problems in the, the drama. And because his wife, the Countess, and Figaro, who's about to marry, neither one liked this idea. <laughs> but then a couple of years later, I think in 1786, uh, Mozart wrote a wonderful novel, a, a wonderful opera, <laughs> wonderful opera based on Beaumarchais play. If you haven't seen The Marriage of Figaro, it is so beautiful. It's, first, it's hard to follow the plot because it's 18th century intricate. But uh, the basic story is the Countess mm -hmm. connives, I think, with her close friend mm -hmm. to try to foil the Count's plot to sleep with the bride and her name escapes me right now. Susanna? Uh, Susanna, you're right. Susanna, thank you. Susanna, yes. She conspires, I think, with a friend to foil the, her husband's plot. She conspires it, with I, Susanna, with her maid, to spoil it. It's OK, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's absolutely my favorite Mozart. Absolutely favorite. And when you were talking about Don Giovanni, it reminded me that the similarity of that description of the burning of the castle and oh, the yes. uh, ending of Don Giovanni. I was seeing the similarities there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess the last thing about Marriage Figaro is that uh, Marie Antoinette liked the play and may have attended. This is shortly before the revolution, remember. But Louis did not like it <laughs> because he felt that it made fun of the nobility, and it does. <laughs> As it happens, we were watching a ver version of Don Giovanni yesterday, and my question was why it was written, why the libretto is Italian when it was Mozart, the German speaker who composed yes. it, and it was set in Spain. And it was about the year, <laughs> which is French. So where does Italy come in? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm not Italy even sure was. that. Uh, <laughs> opera, think, serious opera, was, opera yeah. was with an Italian libretto, yeah. really until Wagner. 
the only things that were done yeah. in German yes. were Zingspiele, uh, low comedy like uh, Magic Flute. Yes. Yeah, opera was Italian in its origins, really, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And now, then is now very, very popular in Italy. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a financial incentive. And maybe Mozart knew Italian better than French or German, or he was Austrian by birth. Well, the librettist was De Ponte. Yes. Who ended up in the United States eventually. <laughs> but I did think that the reason of it for Italian was because they knew it was contro controversial. Uh, the topic, mm -hmm. and that uh, if it had been in French, then it would have been more okay. difficult. It would, more people would yes. have understood what was being said, and therefore yeah. you can point. get away with it. They didn't have the search titles then, so you could get away with it yeah. by having it in a different way. <laughs> <point. laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. So that's why I had Beaumarchais and the Marriage of Figaro. Marie Antoinette had a set to with Louis who finally relented and let the play be performed. And I guess I already said that mm -hmm. uh, it's not impossible that Marie Antoinette also saw uh, the Mozart opera. What about, what about Dickens' connection? He loved the theater, but I don't see the opera coming up. In, Good question. Uh, in his... Uh, you know, there were actually three, the Barber of Seville and the Marriage of Figaro and I've forgotten the third one. La Mere Pobla, the Thank guilty you. mother. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Dickens had seen the play, if not the opera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except, you know, he alludes to so much, but I, he doesn't, I don't see him alluding to music, my, the, those, you know, to opera. No. But he alludes, but not in an academic way. You know, how we academics are, we like to show off all we know about our topic, right? True. He, 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 he um, really, I think was, uh, felt the fact that he was not, university educated and stayed clear of those things that were you know, uh, yeah they're, they're hundreds, like, you know so many shakespearean illusions particularly yeah, but that, that was more lingua franca don't you think yeah probably yeah i've long suspected that dickens probably was pretty fluent in french but you know, he went to Italy, right? And, and he went to Italy. And yeah. he might have been at least uh, and in little reasonably Lord, fluent in Italian in as well. Right there in Italy, right? Mm -hmm. But we, we would never see that in the novels. No. It never makes it show, although it's, I'm just a suspicion given the time he spent there and how much he enjoyed France. Yeah, I, I'm full of anecdotes, but in later years, when Dick, before Dick and Sons left home, they were able to have cricket matches with just Dickens and his sons. <laughs> so <laughs> I love to think of Dickens playing cricket with his sons. <laughs> okay, any last points to raise or? Martha? <laughs> oh, you have to unmute. Martha, do you have a hand up? She does, but I think she's frozen. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thank you.
I know recently there's been a lot of Wi-Fi going down. I had that problem just a couple of days ago, sudden Wi-Fi going down in the middle mm -hmm. of a Zoom meeting. Yes. I just lost her entirely. Well, I think we should be amazed. Here, but my picture isn't. Can you hear me? Yes, now yes. we can. Mm -hmm. No? Yes. Um, Pross, why did, why did Doc Dickens have her... permanently lose her hearing because the gun went off in her was i heard yeah yes. the gun goes off in her the gun her goes off apparently. right by her oh, i realize that i know physically why but why what was dickens purpose in that what was the point of it Hmm. I thought it was, um, I mean, she was kind of a heroine, you know, killing Defarge. And I just thought that would seem kind of sad to have her lose her hearing. Maybe sacrifice is another theme. Yes. Yes. I think right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a good, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And the, and the other thing is, it seems to me that Defarge's death meant a lot too to Dickens in that, um, I don't know, could it possibly be saying that maybe this revolution went a little bit too far? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I guess the French think the novel goes too far. <laughs> well, wasn't, wasn't that a lot of the motivation of, uh, of Dickens? I mean, having, uh, his interest in Carlisle and and yes. and England having had its own fears, and mm -hmm. England have I I think that I am an English woman could explain some of the French resentment of the book because it's mm -hmm. sort of like you know we the English have managed to solve our problems without a violent revolution, and you French guys couldn't do it. Well, the English did have a violent revolution in the 17th century. Yeah. 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 But chopped uh, off the head of the king. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it was followed by a restoration. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All the turmoil yeah. after that, and there was a lot of it, they refrained from going too far. I think the English Revolution had really left a scar and everybody was uh, agreed we're not yeah. going to do that again. yeah let's not go there again <laughs> yeah, that could be why the young pretender didn't get the support in england although he got it in scotland mm -hmm. hmm. with the death of madame de Fage, also, also it was interesting to see how her knitting a, a friends don't even bother to go look for her and this is in contradiction to the loyalty that the Manet family uh, demonstrated between one another. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I don't think she wants to touch Dr. Manette. <laughs> it wasn't the best deal, yes. <laughs> Robert has his hand up. Yes. Um, yes. Can you say, I just want to yes. make a comment that I remember reading a biography of Charles Dickens where a famous author, uh, I can't remember his name, but they, uh, uh, that person visited uh, Dickens home and went to his personal library. And he was astonished to find that the books in his library were all what he considered lowbrow. <laughs> yes. And I think if, mm -hmm. if he had been uh, gone to a university or something like that, it would not have been the case. I think his personal tastes in, uh, <clears throat> in literature were much different than, than uh, some of the other authors of that time. Yes. Yeah. Again, I wouldn't put past Dickens to be trying to learn from the competition. No. What sells? 
<laughs> I have to say, I envy your house, Robert. Yeah. Why is it full of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're getting ready to uh, sell it and move. Oh, oh okay. Most oh. everything's in storage. Oh, God. <laughs> nice job. Maybe, maybe in move. a couple of months. Wow. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess we better call it an end. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It was you. awesome. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? Can we say, Courtney? Uh, the universe is next. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, when do we? When? When shall we meet again? And have we decided on another novel? Because I haven't been in these sessions. So we'll meet again in September. We'll we'll take July and August off. Uh -huh. and we'll resume in September. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if we're ready to, to announce what's okay. next. Yeah. Okay. But, but it has been decided. It, it, there are some proposals. Oh, I see what's going on. You don't want to ruin this. Ruin <laughs> that. I see the what's going on. one. <laughs> <laughs> The universe of 2023. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thanks again. You have to be. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone.